I'm a curator here at Paris Art Museum Miami, and I work with Maria Tietze Potrich on this project that we're all sitting in now. I see a lot of new faces, so uh, at the expense of those who've heard this introduction already, I'll go ahead and give you a little backdrop um, of what we're doing here. Um, Maria Tietze was traveling through the, Am through the Amazon uh, several years ago and came across an initiative uh, which is called the Universidade da Floresta, or the School of the Forests. Uh, which involved bringing uh, theorists and scientists from all over the world to Acre in the Amazon region to exchange knowledge with uh, the local forest communities there. And when we commissioned her to do this project here at PAM, her idea was to recreate a structure that is typical of a kind of communitarian gathering space in these forest communities in the Amazon, and then uh, to have us host a series of lectures throughout the run of the exhibition to give talks, uh, both in the auditorium and here in the space. So um, we are now, uh, in, I'm introducing our fourth uh, speaker in this series. Uh, we have one left coming up in October, but it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Renzo today, who's a professor at the Federal University at Sao Paulo. Uh, give us a, a, a talk last night, which was really fascinating. Today we are following up on that lecture with a, a workshop. So it's meant to be uh, more or less uh, conversational and informal um, after we give Renzo a chance to introduce uh, the, the, the subject matter. Um, we uh, hope you all feel comfortable in joining in. So thank you. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Renee. Well, uh, let me ask you how many of you were here last night for the lecture? All right, so I'm just in, for me to know how much I have to, to uh, summarize and recall of the argument. So the School of the Forest is a project of knowledge integration. So the idea is integrating scientific knowledge and the knowledge of the peoples of the forest. And who are these people? So. Uh, we're talking about rubber tappers who are, uh, you know, the, the, the grandkids of people who migrated to the Amazon two generations ago during the Second World War and even before that. And, uh, and the indigenous populations, what in Brazil we call the Indians, right? And uh, so these are the, the, the peoples of the forest in that particular region where the school of the forest was created. So the, the idea was bringing together uh, Western science and local traditional knowledge and having them uh, interact with each other and in equal terms. Now, so the, the, the idea of the school of the forest is not about climate change. Now, my take on this, what I would like to to discuss in what regard the School of the Forest is, uh, is, is the School of the Forest in the context of climate change or, uh, or the School of the Forest as one instance of knowledge, knowledge exchange in the situation of climate change. And the reason I'm interested in this is that when we think about what scientists are telling us about climate change and what has to be done in order to deal with climate change, uh, there's something in between the lines that is very important but very problematic at the same time. And, and in, in, it is based on one particular uh, cultural circumstance of the U.S., which is the fight of science against creationism or science and religion. But it affects the whole world in the sense of what scientists believe has to be done. And the idea is in order to tackle climate change, people have to believe in science. And if they don't know enough science, they have to learn. And if they think something else, they have to forget about it and believe what scientists are saying. Now the problem is, what happens when you create something like the School of the Forest? Where you do have, you know, uh, tribal chiefs and, and indigenous shamans coming, sitting in the same table with scientists, and when they start talking about what is climate change and what has to be done about it. So <clears throat> what we see in these circumstances is, is, is so interesting, and at the same time, it doesn't fit well 
with this idea that the only salvation for the planet is uh, doing whatever the scientists tell us we need to do. And I'm not saying we don't have to pay attention to the scientists. It's us, right? I mean, our shamans are the scientists. We have to pay attention to them. Now, the issue of imposing this knowledge on everyone else is the, uh, around the planet, that's a whole different story. Uh, and it's very interesting listening to indigenous populations and how they talk about climate change. Uh, and I will discuss, I, I had discussed this yesterday, I will summarize the argument here. But my project is about geoengineering. Have any of you heard about this expression geoengineering, know what it is about? So geoengineering is uh, large scale technological uh, interference in, in the uh, biosphere of the planet trying to act on or mitigate or, or, or over the effects of climate change. So as you probably know, uh, whenever there is a large volcanic eruption around in, in somewhere in the planet, the amount of ashes that goes into the atmosphere is enough for cooling down the temperature of the planet for some time. So one of the schemes in geoengineering is similar to that. So the idea is either increasing the amount of clouds around the planet, so part of the radiation will be reflected in the clouds and go back to the space without reaching the surface, or spraying sulfur particles in the stratosphere, which is the, the high layer of the atmosphere. And the, this sulfur particles would do exactly the same. It would reflect part of the heat back into space, and this uh, solar rays would not reach the surface. Uh, <clears throat> other geoengineering schemes are related to carbon, uh, uh, capturing uh, carbon from the atmosphere. So one of them is uh, what they call fertilizing the oceans, which is sprinkling iron in the ocean in order to make the algae reproduce and expand. And if, the, if, if this, uh, you know, uh, ocean vegetable population expand a lot, it extracts carbon from the atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> what's the problem with that? Well, it depends who you ask the question. Right? If you ask the questions to, to environmentalists, for instance, or to philosophers, even philosophers of science, what they would say is, well, we don't know enough in order to uh, be sure that there will be no side effects that can be disastrous, right? So the, oh, I, I forgot to mention one of these schemes, and this is the most you know, uh, flamboyant of all of them, which is distributing mirrors uh, uh, in the space. Mm -hmm. And these mirrors would reflect the, the sun radiation away, and so this would not reach the, the Earth. All right, so going back to What's the problem with that? So basically, the idea is you know, biochemical and physical systems, the, the biosphere is so complex that it's very hard for us to predict what could be the outcome of major interference in these complex systems. We cannot even forecast climate in, 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 uh, with a degree of precision that makes everyone around the planet satisfied. People are very often unsatisfied with meteorologists, right? You just have to remember how many jokes about meteorologists exist around the planet. So, and this is just one aspect of it, which is rain and temperature. We cannot predict rain appropriately. So would we be able to predict what happens if we uh, spray sulfur particles in the stratosphere? So many people say we, can, we cannot predict that. So it's very, very risky. So the problem with geoengineering is <clears throat> our level of certainty and, and our level of knowledge about how the, the, the biosphere works is not enough for us to do such ambitious uh, interference in, in, the, in the biosphere. Right? And therefore, we should not do it. We should forget about geoengineering. So, there are many books being published right now about this. I mean, philosophers and activists and social scientists saying, uh, forget about geoengineering. This is going to backfire, and we will have 
now we have climate change, and if, if this whole thing's backfire, we're going to have climate change and the effects, the negative side effects of geoengineering. Right? Now, I'm an anthropologist, and then so I typically anthropologists work with populations that are in the you know the, the margins in the borders of the Western world, right? Or at the at the end of the world, quote unquote, right? So it, I started paying attention to what, what other cultures talk about, uh, how they talk about human action over the atmosphere, how humans can act on the atmosphere. The idea of geoengineering is exactly that, right? So humans using technology to change the atmosphere. Now, if you listen to non-Western populations, very often there are many, many stories about how they manipulates the atmosphere in different ways. Rain dances, for instance. Right? Uh, shamanistic rituals, and so on and so on. So I decided to understand whether they have the same kind of moral dilemmas that we have when we talk about manipulating the atmosphere. And if they don't have the same dilemmas, why this is so? So what, what is different in their uh, understanding of the whole thing that makes them uh, relate to the environment in such a different way. So I, I selected two cases. One is, is in, it's in the Amazon. It's one uh, uh, Indian tribe called the Yanomami. They live in the margins, the, 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 in the frontier between Brazil and Venezuela. But the other group that I'm working with, they are, uh, it's an it's a Afro-Brazilian religious group called Umbanda. In a way, it is related to Santeria, the Santeria that you have in Cuba. I mean, they have, uh, you know, some roots uh, are similar in, uh, of Santeria. But there were lots of changes in Brazil across the centuries. Right? And there is one particular group of people in Brazil that they not only say that they can change the atmosphere through rituals. Of course, a lot of people say that. It's not anything spectacular. But for, uh, what, what happens with this particular group is that they have been providing this kind of service, and this is a service of weather manipulation or whatever, to very high profile clients, like the, the, muni the, 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 the uh, government of the city of Rio de Janeiro and the government of the city of Sao Paulo so we're talking about the two largest cities in Brazil, and largest and richest and most sophisticated, right? The, 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 uh, the higher concentration of universities and scientists in Brazil are in these two cities, Rio and Sao Paulo. Now, both municipal governments hired this religious institution in s specific situations. Uh, one of them was the visit of Pope Benedict XVI, so he visited Sao Paulo and uh, the, the weather forecast for the day in which he arrived in Sao Paulo was for rain, and it was raining. And according to one of the uh, largest weekly magazines in, Sao, in Brazil, the Veja, uh, what happens is the, the, the second the Benedict stepped out of the airplane, the rain stopped. And it remained like that throughout his whole stay. And, uh, and the, the municipal government of Sao Paulo had hired this foundation, this institution, to do it. And they did it six times only that year. Uh, all right, and well, let, let me go back to the Indians, right? Uh, the, one of the most important indigenous leaders in Brazil is from exactly that ethnic group. And his name is Davi Copenawa. I'm gonna uh, show you some images. I used them yesterday. Well, these are the major schemes in geoengineering, right? Well, I mentioned this all already. Uh, so this is the, the reservation of the Yanomami Indians here. And as you can see, this is a map of the reservation. And the blue dots are places where you have gold mining, illegal gold mining. So they were really unlucky of having gold under their land. So there's a lot of conflict between Indians and, and illegal miners inside of their, their reservation. So 
Davi Kopenawa is one of the main leaders of the Yanomami uh, nation. And he recently pub published this book, uh, A Queda do Céu, Falling Skies, in which he describes in an unprecedented level of detail how they understand the environment. And when, when I say how they understand the environment, he, in this book, he doesn't describe animals and plants and brains. He describes an enormous amount of spiritual beings that are part of the environment and, and make the environment work. And, how, and he describes how the shamans of the tribe work with these spiritual beings in order to uh, manipulate the climate, the weather. Right? So, uh, and it's really, really amazing the, the, the level of detail that he gives in this book. Actually, these were interviews that he gave to a French anthropologist, uh, Bruce Albert, and uh, Bruce Albert was the one who published the book. But they, they are listed as co-authors in the book. So what he says is, in order to become a, become a, sham, a shaman, what you have to do is a long, very hard training. It's a physical training, it's a spiritual training, a psychological training, it's actually psychochemical training because there's a lot of, uh, there are some uh, substances that they drink in order to be able to connect to these uh, spiritual beings and so on. And, and the thing is so strong that he says in the book that he thought that he would die many times during the training. So intense it was. Uh, so once you get to it, you go through the process, what happens is you establish a network of relations with these spiritual beings and each of them are associated to one element in nature, which is interesting because you go back to medieval Europe and you find the same kind of, 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 of uh, belief about nature, right? The, uh, the, the, the entities in the forest and so on. But anyway, so uh, becoming a shaman means constructing a network of uh, uh, support with these spiritual entities. So you may use them when needed. And then he gives, he gives a lot of examples in the book. So at, at some point there is a drought, so what the shamans do is they drink the, the yakuana, which is the name of the drink, and they get in contact with these spirits, and they get the spirits to work on the environment, bringing the, the spiritual entity associated with the wet season, or with rain, or whatever. Uh, and there's one very interesting uh, part of the book in which he says that the sloth, the spirit of the sloth, has a rifle. And it was a rifle that was acquired from the ancestors of the white man. And the spirit of the sloth, the sloth uses the rifle in order to quiet down the thunders. So the, the, the reason I like this part is that it involves technology, foreign technology. How, in a way, they are incorporating non-indigenous technologies in their belief systems and how they understand reality. <clears throat> All right, anthropological literature is full of such descriptions, right? You don't have to uh, spend a lot of time searching. You quickly find a lot of descriptions about this. Now, uh, what happens is Western so the social sciences, when they address this kind of issues, very often it is interpreted as either something metaphoric or it is some form of symbolism that was created so they can engage with the environment in specific ways and so on and so on. And very often it was reduced to some form of adaptive behavior. So you don't have, you, you, some of the symbols that cultures create can have adaptive value. But this is what I would say, this is one way of silencing indigenous knowledge. So if you, if you understand what they're telling you as some form of symbolic construction that enables them to adapt to the forest in a more appropriate way, you're not listening. You're really not listening, right? There's no conversation going on. School of the forest not working. So this is one, one point. Now, in Brazil, last year, I was giving a talk, and after the talk, 
was describing this case. And after the talk, a journalist came to talk with me, and he said, you know, you know the, the case of uh, the, the wildfires in Roraima? Roraima is a state of Brazil. Actually, let me show. This Roraima is this, this state here where the, the Yanomami are located. So there was a huge fire. A large part of the state was burning. And the government just didn't have the means to, to uh, fight against that fire. And uh, they were kind of desperate. And then the Brazilian uh, Foundation for Indigenous Affairs, FUNAI, they approached the government and said, can we try something? And the government said, whatever. I mean, anything can be done. I mean, we, we have no options. So what, what they did is they came to Mato Grosso and they got two shamans from one native group in Mato Grosso and they flew these shamans to Horaima. And these two shamans, they did a very long ritual, two-day ritual. And after two days, they come back and they say, let's get out of here because it's going to rain a lot. And they did, and it rained so much that 95% of the, uh, of the uh, uh, wildfire disappeared. Again, you have stories like this all over the place. The more interesting part here is that the Brazilian Senate decided to investigate, probably to see whether public money was being used for non-appropriate means or something. So they sent a commission consisted of senators and some technicians to Horaima to try to understand what happened. And they come back and they write a report and the report is fascinating because it says that's what happened. Two Indians came, they did this ritual, it rained a lot in regardless of any meteorological forecast. And that's it, there's no, nothing else to say. And it was filed in the library of the Brazilian Congress. So this, this is what I find fascinating. Right? I mean, not what indigenous uh, <clears throat> leaders can do, but the relationship we can establish with them, right? So you have the recognition of the highest political scale in Brazil. What about the scientists? All right, let's wait a little bit, right? Now let me show you a little bit more of the other case, which is this, this foundation here. It's called Coral Snake Chief Foundation. So as I said, they're uh, related to the Umbanda tradition. This is the woman who is the median through which the spirit of the Coral Snake Chief acts. Here are the official documents. So this is an official document uh, that demonstrates the, the, the contract between the municipal government of Sao Paulo and this foundation. This is Rio Grande do Sul and these two are Rio de Janeiro, right? So these contracts do exist indeed. And uh, you know, evangelical Pentecostal churches are growing in Brazil dramatically in these last two decades. And they tend to be very hostile to African Brazilian uh, groups. So the African Brazilian groups tend to be very discreet in their actions. This is one of the interesting thing about this group of people. They, uh, they go against this tendency and they, they seek constant exposure on the press. And they are always present in very visible situations. So this guy here is Paulo, Fre uh, Paulo Coelho, the author of the book The Alchemist, probably the best-selling book written in Portuguese in history with the medium who received the spirit. And, and Paulo Coelho was the vice president of this foundation for two years between 2004 and 2006. This is Rock in Rio. It's the largest uh, musical festival that takes place in Brazil since 1985. And this is Roberto Medina and his daughter. And he is the owner of Art Plan, the company that organizes Rock in Rio. And he says that his relationship with the Coral Snake Chief is so old. So, I mean, they have been working together for so long and it's almost like the Coral Snake Chief is his partner in business. Well, they hire the foundation to make sure there's no rain during the concerts. And they have been doing that since 1992, I think. I mean, a long time now. Uh, so 
what I'm saying, what I'm saying here is, what I'm trying to show you, these are not irrational people. They're not scientists. Which means that the test of credibility and validity may be different. But not, they're not irrational. This guy is a millionaire. He makes a lot of money with his business, both in advertisement and also in entertainment. So <clears throat> this is a news piece on the action of the Korosnik chief in the opening ceremony in the 2012 London Olympic Games. So what they're saying here is that the medium, the, the woman was in Dublin in Ireland and there were, you know, uh, th there was rain coming from the north and, and sh she diverted this rain to Spain in order to keep London dry for the opening ceremony. And this guy also, he's an award-winning journalist in Brazil. I mean, he's not a, 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 like a, a no one. He's very well known. Uh, now, this is the most interesting part. I, someone told me that they, uh, this, this foundation was a fraud because they had scientists providing them with information. Of course, I, I, I mean, I, it doesn't mean that it's a fraud, but I was very interested in understanding why do they have scientists. And I got the name of the scientists and I went to interview them. And this is one of them, though. this is one of them like 30 years ago. Uh, so I interviewed all the scientists who provide services to the foundation, they, they do provide services. So what he told me was this, in the 80s, this guy was a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, he was a part-time professor. In the other halftime, he was the, the uh, weather reporter in the newspaper we studied Sao Paulo, one of the most important in Brazil. So he was part-time professor, part-time weatherman. And one day, the phone rang in the newsroom, and he picks up the phone, and someone on the other side said, you know, you're the meteorologist, right? And he says, yes. And they ask, what needs to be done in order to stop the cold front that's coming from Argentina? and we'll enter Brazil in the next few days? It's a very unusual question. And he answers, you don't, I don't know if you know what metrology does, but we don't stop cold fronts. We kind of describe them. And the guy on the other side of the line says, okay, if you could, what would you do? According to what you know about the atmosphere. And, and, and he says, well, very often, if the, the pressure, if the atmospheric pressure goes up, it is enough for dissolving or weakening cold fronts. That's what science knows. And the guy said, all right, well, next day, the atmospheric pressure over the state of Rio Grande do Sul goes up, and the cold front disappears. And then the guy calls again. He says, did you see what happened? And the guy said, yes, I have no idea what you did, but..." Or, well, he said that he was very interested in, in going on with that. He didn't believe what they were saying, but he was curious. And he ended up collaborating for 15 years with the foundation. So the foundation, the people wanted to know what science knew about the atmosphere so they could act on the atmosphere in very precise ways. So do you understand what I'm saying? So he wanted to know what a scientific knowledge talks, tells about the atmosphere so they could use this knowledge to act on the atmosphere. So it's very different from you know, uh, Darwinism and creationism because these are so different from each other. There's no possible contact. Here, it's very different because what the coral snake chief was doing is, is he was using science in order to, that's what he says he was doing, right? Using science in order to act and manipulate the atmosphere in more precise ways. So sometimes, once I, I ask, what, what happens if the coral snake chief didn't have scientific advisement? And the answer uh, was, well, probably the actions would not be very precise and perhaps not as efficient. This is very 
troublesome for many people. But the thing is, that's what the School of the Forest is about. I'm not saying it happened because they, I, I only could talk with the scientists. The people in the foundation, they're so busy, they don't have time for me. And of course, there is a huge drought going on in Sao Paulo right now. And for some reason, they could not fix it. And so they are avoiding giving interviews. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the thing is, well, one interesting thing that happened here is, is in 1987, the Brazilian Meteorological Society decided to sue the foundation for illegal uh, uh, activity of meteorology. And, uh, this institution here, CREA, is the, is the agency that regulates the activity of engineers, agronomists, and meteorologists in Brazil. So if you, if, you, if you are going to work as a meteorologist, you need to have a license from these people. So the Brazilian Meteorological Society told them that the foundation was working as meteorologists without the proper license. Now, these people here, they are very conservative, very conservative. Like, for instance, there are new engineering courses being created in Brazil right now. Uh, like environmental engineering and so on. And, and these new courses have a, a real hard time for getting these people to recognize them and to you know, validate the, the curriculum and so on. So th they have this uh, uh, image of being very, very conservative. Now, they received the, the process from you know, the accusation and it, uh, the most impressive thing happens. And they said, this is the, the analysis of the process. They said that the, the Brazilian Meteorological Society was wrong. So the, the, the argument was this. Uh, spirits do exist. They are part of reality. But they are not anything that science should be concerned about. So they are outside of the scope of science. And therefore, they are outside of the scope of meteorology. So we have nothing to do with that. And the case is closed. It's very, very interesting uh, way of presenting the idea, right? Now, what happens is they don't, uh, the foundation doesn't charge the, the, the public government and so on, but they do charge uh, private clients like the Rock and Rio people, right? So they did have to eventually to get a, a, a license from CREA. And uh, so this, this was part of the debate in which when the Brazilian Meteorological Society sued the foundation and so on. All right, so, yeah. In a sense, you're basically admitting that what they do is real. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like, they're, you know, by, by giving them, a, you know, making them actually register, they're yeah. giving them, in, yeah, well, in a sense, you know, it's legal. Yes, what, what happened there is, what they said is, uh, you can do whatever you want, but you have to have a professional meteorologist that could sign. And, and that's exactly when the professor started to act as the you know, scientific vice president of the foundation. So the point here is, this is a, well, I'm not saying that I understand what they say they do. I have not witnessed that I proposed to do a documentary, they didn't answer that yet. But the thing is, this is a kind of conversation that is very interesting, as a conversation. This is the kind of conversation that the School of the Forest proposes. And the conversation is the interaction of knowledge in which one kind of knowledge does not empty the other type of knowledge. So one of the things, as I said, one of the things about you know, going to uh, an indigenous village and seeing you know, the shaman drinking the powerful uh, you know, psychochemical uh, substance and then getting into an altered state of consciousness. If you look at that and you quickly reduce that to some kind of psychiatrical or uh, neurobiological effect of specific molecules in the uh, nervous system of that individual, all right, the conversation finished exactly at that moment. You're not listening. So the challenge of the School of the Forest in what concerns scientists, from my experience, is 
getting them to listen. And why do I think we have to listen to non-Western populations? Well, there are so many reasons, but one of them is they are so much successful, much more successful than we are in terms of survival. They have been around for 20,000 years with the same kinds of technological solutions for surviving in the, in the, envir in the environment, and our civilization has been around for how long? If we think of, if, if, sorry? Sure, sure. Yes. More water is usually used by the forest than by the rivers, and then and then there's a whole system, and that system, uh, so the, the, the clouds that can go to the ocean run back and come to this continent, and if there's enough mass, it creates rain. But because of the unbalance, because of the deforestation, which is also involved in the salt building, of course, the balance is sort of lost, and that is potentially one of the reasons why the place doesn't stop any rain. That's right. Yeah. So, the, my question would be in relation to um, uh, uh, finding the spirits and working collaboratively, in my language, uh, with them to solve, let's say, these kind of huge, huge problems. No? Is that somehow um, uh, we have to take also in consideration the manipulation that is already been going on? So, where's the balance? What, what can still be done? Yeah, it, it, one thing that is clear is that there, there are no indigenous shamans that believe that they can do anything. They, they, are, they cannot. I mean, it's clear. They say they, they cannot do anything. I mean, they, what, perhaps what they can do is restricted and limited. Uh, for sure, we don't really know what they do. But, but you, you, you uh, hear from their... Uh, um, narratives that there are things that work, there are things that don't work, and so on. But th that leader, David Kopenawa, once he was in Rio, and he said something very interesting, uh, the kind of thing that <coughs> gets scientists irritated. He said that the, the, the Amazonian shamans, they have been concerned about climate change for a long time now, and they have been working about it. Uh, well, yeah, yeah well, uh, I don't think they blame everything on the white man, but the thing is, they have been working about it, and, and th that's the interesting part. He said, whatever the scientific equipments of the white people can detect is only what we could not mitigate already. So if it, what, what he's saying is, if the shamans were not working hard for many, many years now, climate change would be much worse. Uh, well, so that's a, of course is a challenge. Sometimes when they say this, perhaps they don't want to listen to the scientists, mm -hmm. right? If they understand that they are irritating the scientists. But but the thing is, we don't really know what they do. But you can see that they are not. They don't believe that they can fix anything. <coughs> uh, in the same way that science, of course, uh, don't think that they can do anything. So, so. Uh, but the, the thing is. Uh, what, the reason I think it's important to pay attention to what they say is that, well, a, as I said, in terms of survival, they seem to be more successful in the long term. Not survival as individuals, and this is one of the things that differentiate us from them. We, we think so much about surviving as an individual, so I don't want to die. 
So the world may fall apart, but I want to save myself. And they think as a group, so it's about the survival of the whole nation. And uh, they're not so much afraid of dying as individuals, uh, as long as they can save the, the group. And, uh, but the thing is, uh, the idea that science knows all there is to know about the environment is nonsense. And you ha just have to read philosophy of science to understand that. You don't have to read, don't need to read shamans. You read you know, uh, Thomas Kuhn, this, the structure of scientific revolutions. You read Paul Feyerabend uh, against method. I mean, there's a lot of things in, in Western philosophy of science that shows that uh, what, can, what, what we perceive in reality is just a very small part of reality. And <clears throat> there's no reason to believe that there's nothing, there's no, this huge amount of reality that we cannot perceive for many different reasons. Maybe because we're not, we have not been, been paying attention, maybe because uh, the way science developed historically uh, uh, focused our attention to some dimensions of reality and not other dimensions of reality. So there's so many possibilities. So when we encounter a civilization that is so different in their take on reality, there is a possibility of, of being able to see reality through other eyes and perhaps perceiving things that we would not be able to perceive through the traditional scientific means, right? Uh, so it's, it's important to, to understand that it's, it's a mistake romanticizing the Indians. It's a huge mistake. It's not about romanticizing their lifestyle, but it's about understanding that as a civilization, uh, we are in a huge existential crisis now, and we need new ideas. And there are so many philosophers today that say that we seem to have reached the point in which there is this paralysis in terms of how much new ideas we can generate in order to get out of the, the crisis. So yesterday, this was, no, two days ago, was published in Rolling Stone. So we make predictions about what's going to happen and two weeks later we realized that the predictions were too conservative and the thing is way worse than we expected. And it has been going on like this for many years now, right? Well, Southern Florida is one of the uh, most vulnerable places in this planet for rising sea levels, right? So one of the things about Southern Florida is that in 50 years from now, a large amount of wealth that is being produced and is part of the wealth of society will have to be spent in weatherproofing, like constructing dikes all over the state and spending an enormous amount of wealth in order to make them work, right? So uh, Clive Hamilton, a philosopher from Australia, has been talking about this. One of the things about climate change is that a lot of uh, wealth that we produce now, we will have to spend just for weatherproofing our lives. So the, 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 the level of uh, well-being will be reduced dramatically, just because of that, because we have to prevent waters from flooding the whole Florida. <clears throat> so this is the kind of things, uh, now in, in, in terms of the Indians, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, a very prominent, prominent uh, anthropologist from Brazil, he says that if there is some, more, some a group, uh, uh, you know, group of people who are specialists in end of the world, it's the Indians. They have gone through so many ends of the world. I mean, their world, started to end in 1492. And it has been ending again and again and again since then. So just for that, it would be interesting to realize how they, what kind of solutions they may uh, give to us. And there's so many, and one of them is, we have to downscale dramatically. I mean, the lowland Amazonian Indians, all of their societies, they work without state and without police, and they can only do it because they are small in size. So one of the things about our civilization is the amount of energy we have to consume just to keep this really large system working all the time. 
so one of the examples of Native American population is we have to downsize. So downsizing means consuming less resources, less energy, and so on and so on. This is going to be so painful. It's really hard to imagine. But, well, I, I have spoken too much, so <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> yes. Obviously, if that's one of the solutions, you know, I mean, the Earth itself, I think, has its own kind of, as a whole, you know, balancing system, maybe. I mean, it has ways of getting rid of things that perhaps yeah. bother them, like us. You know, I don't know. Exactly, yeah. I mean, that's a very good point. <laughs> it's a very good point uh, in, this, in, this, in, in the sense that humans and the Earth are not the same thing. Perhaps the, the, the biosphere has internal balance mechanisms and, and part of it is erasing some of the infection out of it. So it's very interesting to read people like Lovelock. James Lovelock, yeah, James Lovelock. He says in one of his books that it, in order for the, the biosphere to keep working, the bacteria that fixate nitrogenes are way more important than humans. So if the biosphere needs to save something, it will save the bacteria that fixes nitrogens and not the humans. So, yeah, so, so this, this is uh, an important thing. But the other thing is that uh, we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. At the same time, there's a lot of evidence that bad things are going on, even if we don't, cannot really describe precisely what's going on and what's going to happen. Now, if we look back in history, we have an enormous amount of examples of great civilizations that collapsed. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason for us to believe that we are not vulnerable. Cicero wrote, I don't remember if it's Cicero, someone, a historian told me once that someone in Rome wrote in century one BC that Rome would collapse. So this individual wrote about it five centuries before the, the real collapse of Rome, and he explains why. So, so uh, there's no reason for us to, to think that we are not vulnerable and that therefore we should be concerned. <clears throat> the reason I'm saying this is that there's a lot of people who say, since we don't know, we should wait. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous irresponsible answer because uh, well, there's something called the pre precautionary principle, right? The precautionary principle is you, you're not sure about what's going to happen, but you have to wait two different situations. You don't prepare, and the worst happens, and you prepare a lot, and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And you compare in which of these two you lose more. And clearly, the worst is you don't prepare, and the worst happens. Because if you spend a lot of resources preparing and nothing happens, you just lost the resources. But if you don't prepare and the worst happens, it's way more than resources that you're going to lose. So this is the, the idea of precautionary principle. That's why even if we don't know what's going on, we have information enough in order to have to act. And now the question is how? And that's, that's why the School of the Forest is important. Because I have this strong feeling that we really depend on science for a lot of things, but I don't think science gives all the answers now. So we need to open the conversation. I, I think they always say, you know, we have to hope they do do science. They know more than sure. the red one did, but that is a combination because there are so many things to get a school about. It's not just one thing. Like, you know, we know the bee is collapsing. I mean, it's right. that little thing that unites the whole thing. So one thing after another, another, and it's a whole chain of 
to yeah. make it grow like in a food and in culture. Like yeah. You grew up to think now that you're so the devil to eat so much and you're not going to be yeah. able to have enough land to yeah. eat, to produce enough food for the whole, so we have to diminish and work too many. That's right, that's right. Let, let, let me pick this, this, this uh, uh, thing because we can, I can give an example of why we need to listen to other ways of understanding the problem. If you, if you listen to the indigenous populations and you ask them, what's the problem? And they will not say that the problem is carbon dioxide. Of course, carbon dioxide is a problem. But what they would say, you have to go to step back many, many times and understand that there's a whole uh, you know, thing in terms of how we relate to things in the world and how, how that is part of, of the, the source of the problem. Like uh, m most of the indigenous populations in the Amazon, they believe that all living beings or most living beings are human in, in their essence. So the jaguar is human, and uh, you know, the wild pig is human. What happened is in mythical times, for some reason, they lost their human form. And because of that, we cannot contact their humanity. So there are different human worlds that cannot get in contact with each other, except that the shaman can cross the border in very specific situations. But the thing is, if the wild pig is human, and an Indian go and kills a white pig, a, a wild pig to eat. What's going on there? Cannibalism, right? Yeah, it's very dramatic. So there are different ways, different technologies, spiritual technologies for turning that human body into food. Now the thing is, when, when an Indian uh, kills a wild pig. One of the things about killing s another human individual is that you have to show respect. And you have to show a lot of respect, actually. So there are proper ways of killing. There are proper ways of dealing with the dead body. And one of the things about it is, is you don't do it for any other things except eating. Survival. Yeah. So. So, but the thing is, this, this idea of respect is so important. Then you have one of these Indians coming to the city, and he looks at what we do with our food, and they say that we are so disrespectful. The amount of garbage we produce is so uncivilized that they cannot believe it. Now, imagine, that, let's do a, a, a mental exercise. Imagine that you get out of this museum and you start treating each tree as an individual and not as a species. Is there a tree in this planet that you treat as an individual? If you have a garden, perhaps, right? But the thing is, it's, it's, it's amazing how you, we go be, you go beyond your garden and, and the whole planet turns into economic resource, right? And that's something Indians don't do because it's all human. So Indians take care of the forest, not because the forest is nice, not because the forest is pretty, because it's social. So uh, the relationship between one Indian and a tree is a social relation. There are moral codes, there are ethical implications, and this is what regulates that relation. What happened in the scientific revolution? Well, it, it was like that in, in medieval Europe, right? So in medieval Europe, if there was a drought, people would understand that as what? Divine punishment, right? The interesting thing about that is a strong connection between human action and the environment, a direct connection, right? You don't act properly, you have punishment in the form of a drought. Then the scientific revolution of the 16th century comes. What happens? You have people like Galileo, Newton, Boyle, and so many others saying, you have nothing to do with that. It rains regardless of you. You can think whatever you think, you can do whatever you want. It's going to rain or we're gonna have droughts and you have nothing to do with that. Because the rain is just the functioning of some molecules. 
There's nothing alive in the rain. It's just chemistry. Well, that was everything that the, the growing bourgeoisie of the industrial European cities wanted to hear because that's what transformed the whole planet into economic resource. So when science, what science did, the scientific revolution was emptying everything in the planet from having any kind of spiritual meaning except humans. And not all humans, except some kinds of humans, right? <clears throat> and that was very convenient, as I said, because everything turned into economic resource. And therefore, everything become vulnerable to exploitation and devastation. Now, Uh, not directly, right? Uh, it, it, of course, there was a connection with Christianity in the sense that the debates that took place in... in yeah, no, in Latin America, there were very interesting debates in terms of whether the Indians were humans or animals. Right? And so if they were humans, they were to be converted. If they were animals, they could be killed with no sin committed and so on. So, but the, the, this, the thing was already, well, it comes back to Aristotle. Aristotle said that animals are there to be exploited. You know, the scientific framework has imposed itself. Um, and it was also evident at the beginning of your talk where, you know, he's saying this happened. And without uh, sort of reflexively sometimes just say, oh, well, how silly of them to believe that they had that power, right? And so we have a frame of science which has bled that other knowledge out. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But now we have, uh, it's interesting that science has turned around pushing for uh, regulating the environment and realizing that we do have a major effect. This very museum was built on stilts, you know, because of climate change. Mm -hmm. If you look at this museum, it's on stilts because there was recognition of uh, the rising of the ocean. However, we now have legislators in Tallahassee who say, as a defense, I am not, that's what our governor says, and that's what Marco Rubio says, I am not a scientist, and that's my defense for not accepting that humans have an effect on, uh, so it's, it's, it's very, uh, I always think when they say that, well, so you don't take any vaccinations, and you get sick, you don't go to the hospitals, you don't believe in, you're not a scientist, so you won't accept what science says might cure you of a disease, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, they do go, they are believers in science, then benefits them directly, just they don't want to accept it. So I just think that now science is turning towards more of an acceptance of what these, um, these indigenous people were talking about. There's kind of, and then there's the other part of the population that doesn't want to hear it because it's going to affect their daily lives. Mm. They don't want to be bothered by uh, warnings about global change and That's right. So interesting. Yeah, but let me let me comment on that first because, you know, in a way, we're kind of science is such a big, complex, Absolutely. multifaceted thing, but in right? In terms of global warming, there is a the preponderance. Is yeah, like yeah. Ninety-nine percent. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, now the thing is. We kind of we are victims of the idea of identity, and uh, or of the idea that we have to choose, when in fact we don't have to choose, right? At at some point, Manuela Carneiro da Cunha, who was here in the first 
uh, 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 meeting of this series of seminars with her husband, Mauro Almeida, she was being interviewed on Brazilian television. She is a specialist in the uh, Amazonian Indians. And, and there was a, the typical question that journalists ask to anthropologists, which is, you know, you see an Indian dressing in white clothes, white people clothes, what happened? Is it this the individual is not an Indian anymore? I mean, got the Indianized or something? And her answer was fascinating because the answer was depending on who you're asking this question to. Because if you're asking the Indian what happens when he dresses like the white man, he will say, yes, he turned into a white man. But then when he undresses, he turns into Indian again. Right? So the, the, the anxiety of the journalist had to do with this idea of identity and essence which in general Indians don't have. This is a paranoia that we have, but they don't. So uh, Mauro was also walking in the forest with biologists and there was an Indian, there was a guide. You cannot get into the forest without a guide, of course, right? Otherwise you don't get out. Uh, and at some point the guide says to all of them, you see this ant here and this vine. So this ant and the vine are the same thing. The ant turns into vine and, and the biologists said, oh, come on. Right, I mean, animal, vegetable, not the same. I mean, there's no way an ant can turn into a vine. And Dina said, no, no, they do. And they walk uh, further, and uh, the guy says exactly the same thing. This other ant, this other type of vine, they turn into each other and so on. And uh, so very quickly, the biologists diagnose that as, well, the knowledge system, or their system belief or whatever, right? And then a few years later, some people find out that there is a specific kind of fungus that affects the brain of the ants and takes control of the brain of the ants. And they turn those ants into zombie ants. Mm -hmm. And the ants climb to the top of the trees and die there. And when they do it, they take the seeds of the vines up there. And the vines sprout from inside of the bodies of the ants. Mm -hmm. So they were right, well, the guy was right. Actually, everyone was right, yeah. right? Every, this is an interesting thing about how when everyone is right, even when they're saying different things. Mm -hmm. So this is something that it's very hard to work with with scientists, the possibility that different ways of understanding the same thing are both right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea that the municipal government hires a religious institution to produce rains in a place like Sao Paulo, heavily industrialized and sophisticated and so on, shows that politicians are much more pragmatic and they don't care about conceptual validation. Mm -hmm. Well, they want to have the thing fixed, right? And, uh, and uh, so the question is, I have this friend when, when David Kopenawa said that the only thing that the science can detect is what the shamans didn't fix yet. <laughs> a friend of mine who is a metrologist, he always gets angry with this kind of affirmation. And I told him, you know, I have to realize that the, the, the Yanomami shaman and you, you don't understand reality in the same way, but you have the same agenda. Both of you want to save the forest. Now, if you look at the oil companies, Scientifically speaking, technically speaking, they understand reality in the same way as you do, the meteorologist, scientifically. But you have opposite agendas. So who is your friend here? Of course, it's the Indian, not the oil company. So one of the foolish things about science, when scientists turn into diplomats, of course, if they're inside of the lab, let them work. It's working. That's fine. But when they get out and they have to interact, and the school of the forest is one of these places of interaction. Then one of the things we have to convince them is that they have to give up on this conceptual validity that comes only from the scientific method and engage in, in, in cross pollinization with other forms of, of knowledge and so on. They may even, of course, as I said, it's not only the politicians that are pragmatic, pharmaceutical companies are also too because they go to the Amazon and they want to listen to the, the Indians. 
Yeah, they want to listen to the Indians because they want the Indians to show them where the, 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 the plants from which they extract the substances are, right? So there's a lot there. Yes. I agree with everything you said. Uh, the, the only thing there that is complicated is the fact that <clears throat> we can say that we are all in the same boat, but we're not. Mm -hmm. Well, we can be in the same boat, but we're not in the same place of the boat, yeah. right? So, so for a few people, I'm not, I, don't, I don't think they consciously think that way but I can see it happening. I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter if half of the population of this planet dies, mm -hmm. if they guarantee a nice place in Sweden or in Canada or in Southern Argentina. And it will happen. Yeah. I mean, some people will have the means for guaranteeing a comfortable survival. So there's this idea of climate justice, how much which is a, a kind of a, an extension of the idea of economic justice. In order for the wealth of the rich countries in the planet to be constructed, I mean, the colonial and the, and the you know, I mean, there's a lot of things written about this, this kind of colonial exploitation and so on. Now, the idea of climatic justice has to do with that in a way too, right? In, in the sense that it's not that catastrophe comes and everybody dies. No, 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 some people are much more vulnerable. Some people will die first. Mm -hmm. Some people will not die because they have the means for protecting themselves. So this makes the thing uh, even more complicated because some people will, the, mainly the people who will have the means to protect themselves, they will deny the problem up to the last minute. Some of the most vulnerable places are in Africa, South yes. Asia, and the poorest nations. Yes, and yeah. the thing, the sad part is that I believe the people are really are causing the most damage through, you know, deforestation, wealth, you know, are the ones that are going to be able to probably have the result because it causes so much damage on the other one. I mean, we're, we're the first generation is actually being the effect of the first one of the environment and probably the last one that are going to be able to do anything about it. So when you think that way, it's like everybody. Own little world, trying to make a difference, you know, a day at a time. Right? Yeah, that's right. Now, I <clears throat> yesterday Rene mentioned 
pos possibilities in terms of changing things through legislation or the market, right? I mean, I, I, think, I think today there was something in the New York Times about coal and the fact that coal prices are dropping in the international market. And coal is the main uh, source of uh, carbon dioxide. And, uh, and I think that, of course, capitalism is so, uh, you know, so capable of adjusting to new circumstances, right? In the sense of reorganizing in, in, in order to survive and so on. Doesn't mean that all people will survive, but the system can readapt and survive. But I think that what the, when we deal with populations like the, the, the Indians, what they're telling us is, is the thing that, that it's way beyond energy source. It, because it's not only about energy, the thing about oil is that oil, part of it becomes energy, but the other part of it becomes raw material for everything that is plastic in this planet, right? So we're not, even if we stop burning oil, we'll, steep, we'll still pump oil in order to, to produce uh, things from it. So <clears throat> I think the, 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 my personal perception is that even if it's very difficult, I think that the change has to be more radical in the sense that we need to construct a society in which we feel satisfied. And we feel that we live in a situation of sufficiency. Now I ask you, do we have a society where we feel satisfied? No, we live in a society in which insatisfaction is the main merchandise, right? And that's, that's exactly why we keep you know, destructing the environment because the, your iPhone 6 will not be enough when there is an iPhone 7, right? Even if there's nothing that you really need in the iPhone, well, it's already not in the iPhone 6. <clears throat> so, and we don't realize that in order to produce the, the steel that was used to produce your iPhone 6, a forest had to be cut in order to get into the minerals inside of it. And many animals had to die, and many trees had to die. The same thing for the car, for the metal parts of the car to be produced. Forest had to be uh, cut, and, and animals had to die. So this is the thing, that, that's what the Indians tell us. They, they're not vegetarian. They do kill and eat other human beings in the form of a wild pig, sometimes in the form of a human being. But more generally in the form of a wild pig. They do it, but they do it properly. Uh, David Copenhagen went to Europe and they, you know, some people took him to the Holocaust Museum. And he looked at that and he said, and you call us uncivilized. <laughs> uh, he said, we, we eventually kill human beings, but but in a so controlled way in the sense that there's no real impact in the large scheme. Now, this form of industrial assassination as you invented, and you call the Indians uncivilized, right? <clears throat> so, so the thing is, uh, as I said, that when an Indian kills a monkey or, or a wild pig, he's killing a human being. It's, it's, a, it's a heavy psychological experience but they go through it, and that's why they eat it. They value what they're doing. So the issue is not not having iPhones anymore or not having cars, but we have to know what's going on there. We have to take responsibility for all the animals that had to die in order for us to have the car. And once we, 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 we face the problem, probably we'll keep the car longer. Right? This is the thing about the disconnection uh, between us and the world in the, in the industrial production system. We don't have this perception anymore, right? Or the garbage. We pay the municipal government to disappear with garbage. We don't have to think about this anymore, right? Well, there's no municipal government to disappear with garbage in Indian tribes. There's no throwing away, right? So they have to face it. They have to think about it. They have to deal with their leftovers in responsible ways. That's what I said, a downscaling will have to take place in very radical ways. We have to be able to perceive what's go what we're doing in this planet as individuals and as societies. So we have to take everything uh, that 
uh, is in between us, I mean, that prevents us from perceiving our effects on reality, and we have to start facing it. So uh, one of the you know, provocations I do with my students is that I said, no, you don't have to stop eating beef, but it would be very nice if in the package of your T-bone steak, the name of the cow came printed. You have to know who you're eating, right? Or in, in, the, in, the, in the bottle of the cosmetics that you use, the number of animals that had to be killed in order to make that cosmetic safe. Perhaps the name of each one of the animals that had to be killed in order to make that safe. You have to take responsibility. You don't have to stop using it. Once you take responsibility, for sure, you will reduce the usage, and we're going to reduce. But then someone will say, OK, if we stop consuming, the American economy will collapse. Yeah, it's going to be painful. Yeah, it is going to be painful. Let's cry. Yeah. Like going right back to that. You know, okay. I don't want to just pause when we go to gym. Like you say, you know, recognizing that the cow has a name and it's, or the, or the, or the, the lion you know, was, you know, and, and, and the trees and everything else. <coughs> yeah. And that we're just living harmoniously next to each other. We're not necessarily the kings of all this, you know, but rather part of the. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I agree with you. I mean, one, the thing about the temporal scale of the catastrophe is what is, it seems to be uh, you know, changing the game because some people believe that we cannot fix ourselves, but we can do it properly with our kids. Let's teach our kids how to do it properly. But now we have the scientists telling us it's going to happen earlier than we expected. A few, few days ago, right, James Hansen and his colleagues published a new paper saying that the sea level rise will happen in a couple of decades, perhaps five or six decades, and not, not a couple of centuries. So it's not so much about having the kids. Well, it was very unfair, right? We, we screwed, not we, but I mean, the, the thing is screwed and the kids have to fix it. But, uh, but I agree with you, it's, 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 it's complicated. Uh, On the other hand, this has happened in about 100 years. My grandmother was born in 1902, grew up in northern Mississippi and Arkansas. Basically, she put in the garden until she was 90. Uh, she, each year, grew a substantial portion of her food and canned and put up for her whole family. And when there was a child, only bought three things. Uh, they slaughtered their own chickens. They had their own cows. They pigs with their own pork and you know so that knowledge has been lost in a very very short period mm -hmm. of time now it's at the University of Miami if you ask students what is the natural season of a fruit or a vegetable yeah. they don't know <laughs> they think strawberries are available year round so that knowledge ha can That's be right. lost very rapidly but it also can be regained That's very right. rapidly That's right. at least that's the hope <laughs> that's right that's right now going back to the arts it's, it's interesting, uh, I was watching uh, something on YouTube a few days ago, and there's this anthropologist called David Graeber, and one of his presentations he said, you know, go back 50 years in time and, and, and look at what people in the United States believed that the future would be in 50 years. So 50 years ago, how did people imagine the future? And how do we imagine the future now? 
you look at the media production, right? So 50 years ago, you had cartoons like the Jetsons. Everything is so heavily automatized and people don't have to work anymore, right? The robots do the work and so on. Now look at the science fiction today and how does science fiction depict the future? It's, it's amazing. There is no positive view of the future whatsoever, right? Every single movie about the future is a catastrophe. Well, yeah. For, for the hero, yeah. Yeah, well, the world is ending, but they fell in love, something like this, right? Yeah. But this, it's an interesting thing how it gets, and I don't want to bring the arts back because I, 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 what I'm trying to say is we can, you know, connecting to non-Western uh, cultures may reenact some forms of sensibilities that we may have lost. Now, though the arts do it too, right? Artists can make us develop sensibilities and connect to the world in ways that we didn't imagine or so on. So I, I do think it's not only non-Western populations. I think the arts have a very strong role to play here. Yeah. I was discussing that with uh, Camila Sposati, with one of the colleagues of Maria Tizza, and he, she very quickly told me, not all of the arts. <laughs> because of course there is part of the arts that is so market driven that is part of the you know, industrial capitalism. <clears throat> but things like this is, are so interesting in order to make us think things we, we would not think otherwise, right? In terms of confronting us with, thing, with stimuli that we would not have in other circumstances. So I do think the artists have a strong, a important role in this too. Maybe we need a new religion that sort of sees the world in those terms, you know, because, um, you know, obviously religion has, is very powerful and they, you know, they, they attack a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people just really need to be told rather than, you know, too many black, you know, gray areas. And perhaps that's one of the things that needs to happen. Like, you know, religion right now is sort of downturned a certain way, you know, but perhaps what it needs is to have that fabric that it had, you know, in the early days of Christianity or whatever else that actually drives people to, to make those sacrifices, to actually, to, to actually save the world, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, what, it, what we need is really nature, sort of, and it's, yeah. you know, we, I don't even, you know, we have to, there has to be some sort of solution that is going to bring a lot of people in to this thought, thought, you know, way of thinking in order to change it as quickly as we need to change it. That's why I said it's either going to be a catastrophe or there's going to be some sort of way that the human beings are going to unite in this kind of thinking in order to change. The Pope? The Pope, yeah. Yeah. And he drew a moral correspondence uh, between action on climate change and, right. and Christian Christian values, right. which was striking. I'd never really heard that argument made before. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. But I mean, this this gets at something that I think is interesting because, like, a lot of what you've been talking about is. Um, expanding or the potential that there that exists in expanding the scientific imagination to incorporate different belief systems uh, indigenous belief systems etc um, but I keep coming to this notion and you alluded to it earlier when you w mentioned the, that political soundbite about I'm not a scientist <laughs> um, in fact the scientists at least in this country are so disempowered they're, they're so Weak. It's really pathetically weak how um, their voice uh, has been. Uh, the, the politicians, the policymakers, are able to brush it off completely. In fact, um, among many, uh, among the right wing, uh, there's a, a one one argument that come up so, comes up a lot is that the scientists are corrupt. Have you heard this? Yeah. Uh, like uh, climate gate. That there's a lot. There's money. Yeah, climate gate. You know that there's money to be made in publishing articles uh, that get people excited about uh, climate change, whatever, what, 
which obviously is, if there's money to be made anywhere, it's in like being <laughs> employed by the by the oil companies or whatever. But um, the 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 point I'm getting at is that um, among the population, there seems to be this skepticism that's been engineered and manufactured of the scientific voice. So um, the question is, where else? Where where else do we need to amplify pressure? Or who else do we need to empower? Uh, we've mentioned you know religion. Um, you've mentioned the arts. You know, it's 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 partly about finding these different avenues, and, and then that's the same kind of thing that you're. Yeah, let me let me let me let me. Yeah. Yeah, but it, let me. I, I when I I said that a, a radical downscaling will have to take place. Uh, 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 I think that it. I, I really think that will be necessary, and it may be incomp incompatible with some forms of social and political organization and some forms of religious organization. When I'm saying downscaling, I'm saying diversity. We need to, you know, diversity is more important than, uh, no, let, me, let me explain why diversity is important. I mean, in, in the Amazon, there's this thing about the, the women in the indigenous and the uh, local traditional community uh, groups in collecting different f types of plants, like cassava, right? So it, this is a very interesting thing because, as Mauro mentioned right here, it's not utilitarian in the sense that they don't they don't do it because they have to do it. It's a part of a cultural tradition. So they multiply the amount of different forms of cassava, for instance, and they and they uh, keep that diversity uh, uh, alive in their gardens, and so in the same way that the traditional indigenous communities in, in uh, central Mexico, they did it with, with different forms of pepper, right? And, and not only keeping that diversity, but also mixing them and producing new types and so on. So, and then you have the large agribusiness companies and, and uh, biotechnology companies like Monsanto imposing you know, the, a radical unification and, and standardization of what kind of crop you use. It's way more efficient in terms of productivity. But what, what we don't see is how vulnerable it makes us in a situation of climate change. Because that, that kind of thing is developed for a specific condition of the environment. When, when uh, the Indian communities, they have like 30 different types of cassava and they keep it, what they're doing is they're protecting themselves from climate variation because most likely a few of those types will be able to adapt to a new climate, right? So, so this idea of diversity and, and biodiversity in this is very important. But what I fear about large nation states and unifying religious systems is how it kills diversity. suddenly our houses and our streets were flooded and we couldn't get out of it. So the, all the building and all the, they're not, cons they don't care if we tell them that there's gonna, that Miami is gonna be underwater because that's 2030, 2040, they don't care. They are only interested, and that's true for Monsanto, they're only interested in the here and now and making the money now. So I don't know, is that true that the indigenous people have a, Different sense of time. <clears throat> I, I, I have to say that, you know, a, a, an anthropology specialized in in the, the Amazonian tribes will be more appropriate for I giving see. you this answer. But, but for for what I know, it's not only they have a different sense of time, and it, it, it's manifested in many different ways. Uh -huh. Right? One, there is this. Uh, 
media thing about the Maya having a, a circular, cyclical calendar and so on. But it's more than that. It's, it's the idea of how, you know, the idea that they are integrated with the environment, it, it, it does happen, but it happens in a very special way. You know, most of these language, the native language don't have a word for nature. And why would that be? Why would they don't have a word for nature? Because everything is nature. No, because nothing is nature. It's not because everything is nature. It's because nothing is nature. You understand what I'm saying? If the tree is a human being, if the wild pig is a human being, there's no nature. Everything is society. So, so that makes a lot of difference. Oh, we are all part of nature. Yeah. Well, they're, if, if, they, if they behave improperly, they will be punished. Either by the elders of the tribe or by the uh, spiritual beings. It's not that, I mean, I'm not saying that all Indians are good individuals. Of course, there's a lot of social control and so on, as in any place, right? But clearly what happens is you have moral codes and ethical concerns regulating the relationship between what we call humans and what we call non-humans, right? And that, that makes a difference. Now, uh, well, going back to the issue of diversity, uh, when I say a downscaling, I I'm, I'm, I'm really believe that nation states as we have them are not appropriate for dealing with climate change. I hope I'm not arrested. <laughs> yeah, but the, let me give you an example. Think about the Sahara Desert. There is people living inside of the Sahara Desert. How can you adapt to that kind of environment? Nomadism, right? You have to keep moving all the time. So any single semi-arid and arid place in this planet in history had nomad tribes, including Northeast Brazil, which is a dry place, right? So you had the local Indians, they were nomads. Then the Portuguese arrive. First thing they do is private property, fences. And then the first drought comes. It's a huge catastrophe. So what was the source of that catastrophe? It was not lack of rains. It was the imposition of private property. Because it disarticulated a, a system that worked relatively well with the fluctuations of the environment. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is there are some forms of political systems that will not work with climate change. So we will have to be able to, before or after the catastrophe, but we will have to think about this. But that's so interesting eh, because we, can, um, we cannot imagine, let's say, a world without nature states, even if the nature state is like, what is it, 150 years old, something like that, 200 years old? Yeah, okay. yeah. It, it, it's so not it's like That's right. There are. <coughs> it's, I mean, we are thought to believe that without nation states, the this is the end of the world, mm -hmm. right? And we forget that there was world before the nation states, and there will be world, and there is world in between and behind the nation states. Right? There are so many networks of things going on in the planet. that are so much more interesting. There. Well, the the thing about nation states is paying taxes. And, and funding yeah. the whole infrastructure. But I say a, a, a huge downscale has to play, take place is rethinking all that. Right, and uh, in the sense that we will still have the networks, we will have, have to make internet work globally, but the way we're gonna fund that may not require necessarily a nation state. And the way we're going to do governance over resources don't need necessarily a nation state. And that's one part, place in which the Native Americans are so interesting in terms of uh, uh, provoking us, which is the fact that they don't have a state, right? So they, they are capable of existing and surviving without states for thousands of years. Yes. I'm I was just, just going to finish on that point. Mauro, in his talk, 
uh, made this really interesting point about how um, specifically with respect to Acre in the Amazon, um, the Brazilian federal government was having much difficulty policing that area as far as illegal logging and uh, even oil companies or pharmaceuticals were even, um, because they were using federal police and they were just uh, unable to do it. But at one point there was a shift in policy where they empowered the tribes to mm -hmm. protect the lands themselves and they were actually very effective at beating, beating out these illegal loggers are much more effective than the, the big, mighty nation state. Yeah, that was a pretty interesting point. That's right. I mean, think about garbage production. What is, how capable is the government of doing surveillance on every single situation where you produce garbage? <laughs> it's impossible. So it, the, the cooperation of people is required. So there's so, there's so many things that happen. The world, a large part of the world uh, keeps going, not because the states are there, but because we make it. And there are situations where the state collapses and life goes on. Uh, not everywhere, but there are situations where it happens, right? So, uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's very complicated because, uh, because the whole thing is set up in order to depend on the nation states. Right? So we, we are led to believe that it's absolutely impossible to do anything without nation states. And of course, it is possible. One of the struggles of indigenous populations in Brazil now is exactly the fact that half of them don't want to be part of Brazil. And the other half want to change Brazil in order to make room for them. So those who don't want to be part of Brazil are the quote unquote uncontacted tribes. So they are absolutely aware that what's going on outside and they don't want it. And that's it. But then you have all the other tribes that have some form of relationship with the Brazilian government. But the problem is the Brazilian legislation treats the Indians as childs who are not capable of making decisions. So they need to have some kind of other institution that does it for them. So it's, they, it, they treat the Indians as incapable or as, as children. So the thing is how to create room in a place like Brazil for someone who wants to be different. I mean, the amount of problems is enormous and this is related to nation state because well, when an Indian go and kills another Indian, can you prosecute the Indian using the laws that were created for the white people? No, okay. But then you're going to have someone else in Brazil saying, okay, I want that privilege too. I wanted to be able to kill my neighbor. <laughs> and I, I, I want to have a special law for me. Because that's, we have been doing this for centuries. We have been killing each other. We want to keep doing it. We don't want you white people to mess with us. So you, you see the, the, the amount of trouble it causes because the nation state means homogenizing and equalizing everyone. There's no room for difference which means that there's no room for Indians in Western type nation states. But isn't the Indian problem, you know, quote unquote, really going right back to the fact that, you know, the white man came into the Indian territory, stole his land, and therefore, you know, they, they can't deal with the fact that these are not children. These people were actually owners of the land, and in order for us to to admit that, then we have to admit that we stole the land. And I think that right there is a problem that happens with not just the Indians in, 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 sure, in sure. Brazil, but all over the world, oh, sure. native people, because it requires, you know, for us to actually take their, both their beliefs and, you know, take them seriously requires us to respect them and to understand what we did. And that is something that most nation states that's right, that's, that's right. Really, so we, we're, you know, we're, we've got a really big problem in this country. I think these people do have a lot to say, you know, but first we have, we have to want to believe it and we want to have to sort of um, subscribe to it without, you know, and how do you do without actually, you know, the situation, you know, that, that they don't want to do that for those particular reasons. You know? We did it here in America with that. All yeah. their land, put in little spaces, and, uh, and that's going on everywhere. Australia, exactly. New Zealand, yeah. you know, all over the world, you have that situation okay. where you know the, the indigenous people 
way to, to live. Uh, yeah. And, and the that. Aborigines are just that's right, that's to, right. Really, I've mean, been to Australia, and they're very, very. Um, they have incredible ideas about the land and about you know. In fact, they know where like they knew where, where like uh, uranium grew. You know, they they had all this knowledge and they, they have all this knowledge. Same thing with New Zealanders, you know, the Maoris and their idea of like land ownership and the rights of painting. You know, they 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 were signing off. Sure, you know, nobody owns the land. Yeah. You know, so. You know, but we're we're back into that situation that in order to take sort of really want to understand what they can believe and bring them to the conversation, we have to sort of acknowledge. Yeah, that's why that's why I, I, I again I mentioned downscaling. One of the things about well the Indians don't have a term for nature, they also don't have a term for Indian. Right. Of course they're not Indian for them, right? They do have a term for white, but they, they the term they decided to use, most of them in the Amazon decided to use for white is the term enemy. So they, <laughs> enemy, enemy, the term, the, the concept of enemy was the one that they believed fit better, best to the whites. So, so very often they refer to the whites as enemies. The but, the, but well, the enemy, enemy, they don't see enemy as we do because enemy is not someone to be destroyed. Enemy is someone to be maintained, to be kept, because it, it, it's part of how reality keeps being generated and constructed. Right? So even so you, need you need the enemy. You need a friend, but you need the enemy as well. Right? And of course, between friend and enemy, the white look like enemy more than friend. But, you, but the thing is, uh, so what I, what I think is places like Brazil in 200 years from now, my forecast is that if we are successful in adapting, we will have to turn into 200 nations, not one nation. As I said, I mean, the never, it never occurred to the Indians that they had to unite and to create the United Nations of Indians of the Amazon. That is unthinkable. They keep difference. So one of the things about <clears throat> climate change is that it is foolish to believe that we are going to find one solution that will be good for everyone. We will have an enormous amount of different solutions for different situations and different people. We require different institutions and different laws. So I think we're going to have an enormous amount of countries in a much smaller size. And that will be, and, and it doesn't solve the problem of mobility, right? So we are having a huge immigration crisis in Europe now. And, and part of it is clearly connected to climate change. So uh, turning Brazil into 200 small nations doesn't solve the problem of mobility. We will have still to f figure out how to work with that. So you think actually rather than a big global, you know, you, you think more of smaller, tinier nations? Yeah, well. So, you know, dividing, um, I, you know, I think it's kind of going backwards rather than go, I mean, I think we need to really think of ourselves as part of everything. And, and then connect, and connect, connect and local. Yeah. You know, no, no, you know what, what, I, what I have in mind is classic, classical Greece, right, and in which they felt Greek, but only when the Persians were around. All the other time they were not Greek. They were something else, and they were fighting against each other. When the Persians came, they united. That's pretty much like the Indians function. But the, the, the thing here is that although if, you're, if the, your neighbor's house is on fire, yours is on fire too, uh, you don't have to have the same way of, of fighting fire necessarily, because the houses are not the same. And, uh, and, but the other thing is, the, the, the complication is political, right? If, if I, I take one federal government and I split it in 200 different federal governments, the amount of energy that we are going to spend in politics is much higher than we do it now, right? And that is good. You know why? Because you're going to spend our time doing politics and not consuming, which is exactly what the Greeks did. They spent all their time doing politics and the carbon footprint was very small. Mm -hmm. So we have to spend our energy fighting against each other 
in a civilized way. Gotcha. But if we do it for a long time, we're not going to consume. We don't have to consume. Instead of, yeah, in, instead of, of, of accumulating things in our backyard, we're going to dedicate to the noble task of politics. Yeah. As the Castro's kind of doing that by keeping people with food, and they have to hold people keep food all the time. You know, it's like I don't know. That's a solution. <laughs> It's a young girl, I mean, she is totally extreme, but it's a video that goes around this young girl that all the garbage she has produced in the past two years, she's putting in a little yard. I don't know if anybody has seen that video. But I like to, I try to look at the like the way she lives, it's interesting, but it's, it's just that, you know, trying to reduce the consumption. That's right. And her trash is just in that little glass container. You can Google it and see it, very interesting. Yeah. But not, yeah, well, we, can, we don't have to spend all the, all the time doing politics. We can spend half of the time doing politics, the other half doing art. Uh, exactly. Like music. music, poetry, right? Just like the Greeks, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the, pro the, pro the, the problem of the Greeks is that they had many slaves. Mm -hmm. And we have to do it without slaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, we have to get Socrates and get him to work the land. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, it's, uh, it's almost 5 o'clock. I just want to thank you all for coming. And once again, thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful. It was a pleasure. Thank you.